if Satoshi were to ever make himself known with the evidence and move those coins and make his face known, suddenly all the detractors of Bitcoin have a face that they can attack. And suddenly it becomes not about Bitcoin, it becomes about Satoshi Nakamoto, the founder and creator. They'll attack character. They'll attack his um, personal interests of you know wealth and riches and everything like that. And that in itself can break the network. That's why I say it's both the greatest strength of Bitcoin, but also its greatest weakness if he, she, or they were ever to make themselves known Bitcoin is solving for human behavior, but not just that, human sin. I realized that there was a great framework to understand all the behaviors that Bitcoin was solving for. It was the seven deadly sins. So the seven deadly sins being pride, greed, gluttony, wrath, envy, sloth. I came down to three core principles that make Bitcoin successful. So the first principle I think is minimizing adverse human behavior. That is the behavior that would work in opposition to the intent of the system. The second and third are simplicity and meritocracy. You remind me of, uh, I have no clue how to pronounce him, Chamat Papalatia. <laughs> there's, there's a really oh, rich Chama billionaire Papatia. on the All In podcast. Mm. I listen to All In every single week. And oh, I nice. think, because he, he's, I'm pretty sure Sri Lankan background. So I've got a Sri Lankan background as well. And I think there are similar features. So I think the nose is one. Yes. And then we all have very similar kind of features because um, there's a few other, even Indian politicians that I resemble that I sometimes get, oh, hey, you look like uh, Abhishek Bachchan or, oh, you look like, I haven't got Chamath yet, so I'll, I'll take that as a win. Maybe I could be a billionaire one day. <laughs> yeah, I also think you a little bit sound like him. Like, oh, okay, like cool. I had got like uh, instantly when I spoke with you like a minute, I was like, he he is like that. <laughs> it's an, it's maybe an interesting I, I should uh, be a Chamath impersonator and see whether yeah. I can get into the All In Summit for free as a but, Chamath impersonator. <laughs> but I guess yourself, you you all you 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 usually don't see that that good because I get always the comment that I sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But I think people mm -hmm. just say it because I'm Austrian. And I speak English and maybe I have a similar tone of voice uh, than him, but I don't hear it. Like, I mean, I listen to myself, I'm like, it's, it's, it's not even close to that. Uh, but probably like when Americans, they usually don't listen to Austrians a lot. Uh, and the one Austrians they always listen to is Arnold Schwarzenegger because they are in, yeah, he's in all, the, all the films and I'm like a little bit, uh, close to him. So people are like, uh, oh, you look like, you're like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Well, I will say you do sound like him as an Australian who barely talks to any Austrians. Because I, I don't think I've met an Austrian, native Austrian speaker here in Australia. Mm. So it's yeah, very I mean, rare where I'm. Yeah, I even got it from a German guy. So like even from someone in Germany who's <laughs> right next door. Who it, <laughs> even he said it to me that I'm, I'm uh, um, sounding like him. But I just don't hear it. But yeah, maybe... <laughs> Maybe I should, uh, yeah. But yeah, let's let's get into uh, the the topics. Um, it's already really interesting with you. Um, sure. uh, hi, Alf. What are you doing uh, in the Bitcoin scene, and and uh, what are you all all about? Sure. Um, what am I doing in the Bitcoin scene? So there's the standard. I'm hodling. Uh, I think everything else but Bitcoin is shit coins. It took me a while to get to that position, but in my going down the rabbit hole of what Bitcoin is, why it's valuable, why I should care about it. I asked questions that got me to very similar scenarios that we all get to the whole you know, hard versus soft money, Austrian versus Keynesian economics. Um, but for whatever reason, something in the back of my mind always said that there's something else, like it wasn't the whole picture of the puzzle. So a bit of background, I do a lot of corporate planning for large organizations here in Australia. And the one thing that I always say executives is this exercise called the why, how laddering where if you've got a problem you're trying to solve or a strategy you're trying to build, you keep asking yourself why until you can't ask that question anymore because you've reached the, the highest order principle or value or problem. And at that point, you ask, well, how? How can we solve it? So I did the same thing when I was going down the Bitcoin path and I ended up at a conclusion which I haven't really heard of in the space. I actually don't believe that Bitcoin is ultimately solving for money. I think Bitcoin is solving for human behavior. And 
that came from constantly asking why features in Bitcoin were so successful, why the monetary system was broken. And I always came back to human behavior. And when I got to that realization, that's what's forming part of my um, research and the research that I do, and I'll come back to that. Um, but it led to more profound questions for me um, about what happens after Bitcoin. Because if you think about if Bitcoin isn't solving for money and it's solving for human behavior, once we fix the money, what's going to happen to those human behaviors uh, that are no longer in money? And then my mind started realizing all of these bad actors in the fiat system that are taking advantage of this system are going to move into any other industry where it's easy for their effectively bad behaviors to manifest. And the dystopian element of that is instead of stacking fiat, which is what they're doing right now, they're going to start stacking sats under a Bitcoin standard. So I saw, I'm starting to see this problem emerge, assuming that we meet, we get onto a Bitcoin standard that we're going to be faced with far greater problems with these bad actors stacking sats. So it led to what I'm doing now in Bitcoin, to answer the question. Um, I've started a research publication called The Bitcoin Curve. And the purpose of the publication is to research how we scale Bitcoin beyond money to tackle that very problem. How do we tackle the bad actors in fiat leaving fiat into things like healthcare, education, infrastructure, energy, agriculture? You name the industry that supports our civilization. After we fix the money, it, they're going to go somewhere. And it's, I think it's incumbent on me to start thinking about how do we solve for all of those other industries, but in a Bitcoin way. So taking the core Bitcoin principles, the Bitcoin philosophy and ethos, and creating a framework for us to solve these problems in other industries so that we all coherently solve for the problems of human behavior. So that's, that's uh, what I'm that's, trying to do with Bitcoin. That's an amazing thing because uh, when when we say Bitcoin fixes money and uh, money is kind of the, the base layer of everything, um, what it actually does is fixing our incentives. And with that, is, is that what you mean with 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 uh, it changes human behavior because it changes the incentives of of people? I think it limits humans' natural tendency towards sinful behavior by making it impossible for them to express it. And what I mean by that is, if you leave the gate wide open, people will walk through it. If you close the gate, people will think twice about trying to get through it because it's either more difficult or maybe you've put up you know, that barbed wire fence. So it's harder. There's a, a disincentive, I'd probably call it, to try and break through the gate. I'd say that the fiat system as it's structured today has all of these gates wide open. So you think about soft money, money printing, it's wide open to take the easy way out to print money. Um, the, there's no proof of work in any of the fiat monetary systems. So there's the ability to, to gain a lot without doing any work. And all of us are inherently lazy to some degree. It takes a lot of effort to break out of that in order to put the effort in to get the reward. Because if you were presented with two options, do the effort to get the reward or do no effort to get the reward. Which one are most people going to choose? Mm. They're going to choose yeah. the, I'm not going to do any effort. Like, why would I expend it? It makes no logical sense. So I'd say that it's a disincentive or it's a closing of the gates um, is what I'm talking about that Bitcoin does. Um, and these gates are wide open in a whole bunch of other industries. And part of my problem is that, let's just say you solve money. Do you think that the people that are currently exploiting these wide open gates are just going to say, hey, I've learned my lesson. I'm never going to do it again. I'm going to be a model citizen and I'm not going to try and exploit a system. The likelihood mm. is no. And they're just going to shift to somewhere else where the gates are wide open. It's interesting uh, to think about when, when Bitcoin is, because I truly think that Bitcoin brings out the good intentions in people. Uh, Uh, and, and brings out something great in, in, in personalities. But I'm not sure if this is because we are now in an early group of adopters. This is where I'm struggling a little bit with, 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 uh, if, if Bitcoin, how Bitcoin will change society. And I think of like the long term view, because the one fact is, yes, when you look at Bitcoiners who get Bitcoin, they're all of a sudden questioning other things. They are more critical thinking. They are all of a sudden 
getting in shape, getting to, to know about nutrition and all those those things, uh, which is crazy to think about what what Bitcoin does. But what I'm also thinking, maybe that's just because we're in a really early group that is critical thinking. And because when you get into Bitcoin, because of the price, you get exposed to a high performer, critical thinking group that is so different than the rest of the world. <laughs> um, that it's because we are in this early uh, minority uh, and this is why we are different. Or could it actually be because of Bitcoin, we're changing our behavior and long-term society completely changes for the better? It's probably a combination of both. And this is another part of the research that I do because there's three pillars to it. I've got Bitcoin's principles. I've got public interest technologies, which is a very new emerging field and technology adoption models. On the technology adoption front, I think you're bang on, which is every technology goes through an adoption cycle to some degree. And it's sometimes you see the curve where it's sort of like it's that S curve. We see the technology adoption S curve, or we see the bell curve, but they both largely say the same thing. At the very start, you've got your, your innovators. These are high risk tolerance dreamers that challenge the status quo, that come up with the new ideas. And that's the birth of Bitcoin. And you'd call them the cypherpunks in this case, Satoshi, Hal Finney, that OG crew from all the way from the 60s, 70s, and 80s as the cypherpunk move had started to grow to where we landed. I'd say that they're those dreamers. Then you go to the early minority. These are those who see the invention have a high risk tolerance because you have to re remember when you're talking about Bitcoin now, back in 2010, I was nowhere to be seen, obviously. But those people were so forward thinking, so visionary themselves, high risk tolerance for what they were doing, but invested anyway. And I think we're now into the, we're past that early minority stage and we're about to hit the early majority. And so all of those behaviors or those personality types we've largely got the easy ones. That first part is the easiest part of any adoption cycle because you're going to get those high high risk, high reward people coming in, those innovators. Now it's, I think, one of the harder portions because now you're going to go into the early majority where we start to get to that 50% adoption where we have people that are going to have far lower risk tolerance. We're going to have people that are far lower in their maybe innovative thinking. And the age-old saying... Um, Nobody likes change. Everyone will push against change to some degree. And I think we're about to hit those people that will consistently push against change, whereas that didn't exist in the first portion of those that adopted Bitcoin. So it's also interesting when I think of uh, how the Bitcoin community evolves. I had yesterday a, a, a Twitter space where someone was criticizing that the Bitcoin community lost its roots. Uh, and... I, I disagree with that, uh, but to some extent, uh, it's it's true that uh, the especially this year the topic changed. Like, oh, Bitcoin ETFs about the price. There's some inflows of but from the fiat system, uh, and and there are some uh, Bitcoiners in the industry that are now just talking about every day about the inflows and outflows and what does this mean for the price and and. And I, I couldn't be less interested in that. Like, I think I'm one of the only ones who never looked at any inflow chart of an ETF. So I have, I have not, I have not even a clue what, what, <laughs> how many inflows and where I should look this, this information up because I'm generally not interested in it. I'm just interested in, uh, what does this mean on a broader scale for Bitcoin? Like the Bitcoin ETF brings legit, legitima, legitimization, uh, to, uh, Bitcoin, it brings a new group to Bitcoin. All of a sudden, I hear that a lot uh, when people say like, oh, all of a sudden, my father is open to the idea of, of Bitcoin. My my older uncle, all of a sudden, is open to the idea of Bitcoin because of the Bitcoin ETF, because BlackRock gave, gave, BlackRock gave this, this, yes, you can also invest in that asset, uh, sign on it. Uh, so it's interesting how how the community changed. D did you notice some, some community changes in, in, uh, in, in, since you are here or is, is this something that you like, um, you also don't care, care about? Yeah, I don't No, no. So I do care be, only because it marked a phase where a new cohort of people would start to adopt. And I always look at it in the technology acceptance model, which is 
we're going to that early majority, what removes the barriers of that adoption for that class of people so that we maintain the adoption of this as an asset class? Because the last thing you want at this point is the ideology of Bitcoin, which I think is a good one that says self-custody, it's about individual sovereignty, freedoms, rights, property rights, etc., I know the ETF is at odds with that, given that it is centralized under a couple of entities that technically custody the asset and you're just taking a paper version of it. But at the same point, if you don't, if you slow the adoption down too much, number one, you extend how long it takes us to get this to a Bitcoin standard, which extends pain across the world. Because if we truly believe that fiat is the root of a lot of the problems that we're seeing in the world with the really bad incentives for war profiteering for the printing, the ballooning of debt, the, the wealth inequality that comes from a fiat system with the wealth being printed, centralizing at the top, creating greater disparities. No one would want to see that continue for longer than it has to. So at the same point, I take it with the grain of salt, which is, yes, it's not necessarily the best thing I think everything is good for Bitcoin, to be honest, but it may not be the best thing to the ideology of where the initial Bitcoiners came from, but it's great for the adoption part. And I prefer the adoption part rather than the original ideology, purely because I think change is the only constant that we have in this world. And to not have that change mindset around what Bitcoin could be and what Bitcoin should be for a certain group of people and not have that change mindset around that would will stick you into a uh, into an ideology, into a thinking that may be detrimental to Bitcoin's long-term success. So I've, I'm always change, change, change. Is there, is there a chance that um, this behavior model of Bitcoin is taken over by bad actors who then abuse Bitcoin or does the Bitcoin model fixed incentives so that even if you have bad intentions, uh, you kind of cannot take Bitcoin over because you're only doing good to the network with the adoption. Uh, like, for example, if, if BlackRock would be a bad actor and they're now collecting Bitcoins and now they're doing something with paper Bitcoin, uh, they probably would shoot themselves in the foot because at some point it will come onto the top. Maybe it takes one year, maybe it takes 10 years. I don't know how long, but uh, is, is there a chance that bad actors to overtake uh, Bitcoin and put the same thing that we have in the fiat system just on Bitcoin with another asset as the same way that they kind of did with gold? The way that I tackle that one is I'm a person that always believes that there's a risk. There's no such thing as zero risk and there's no such thing as 100% return. It's about being able to identify what that risk is and the likelihood and the consequence of that risk that gi gives you a more objective framing to it. So there's always a risk that big, that BlackRock might do that, could do that. But I almost think of it back to the block size wars. Because at that point in time, if we think back to there, that was an existential battle for Bitcoin, you could almost call it. But mm -hmm. the system that is Bitcoin um, was built in such a way to allow the meritocracy of the best idea winning out to shine through because it is really a grassroots movement that requires that, de that decentralization and that voting power of the nodes and the miners meant that no one central authority could really do anything to the network. Now, with the BlackRock example, I think the likelihood of that occurring is very low. And there's probably two reasons. Number one, the, the, the supply of Bitcoin as it stands today, we've already mined the, the majority of the entire supply. So it's already in circulation. So it's not like any net new coming through miners being owned by BlackRock is necessarily going to distort the system too much. I think that there, I can't, I actually don't know how many Bitcoin they, they hold right now, but I'm going to assume that it's less than 5% of the supply, whatever it might actually be. I don't know whether they'll ever get to a point of accumulating so much Bitcoin that they can exert that much F force onto the system itself, that the system itself can't self-correct. Now, I think that if you think of it as a financial crisis or something like that, there may be downtimes, there may be turbulence, as in they paper over it, they destroy the system, or they try to pervert the system, it comes crumbling down. But does that destroy the system? And my answer to that is probably not. So if it doesn't destroy the system, then it's probably a temporary correction that might see price volatility 
confidence volatility, but TikTok, next block, it'll continue going. And we all have such short-term memories as human beings that what happened six months, 12 months ago is forgotten. And we see that in Bitcoin cycles. Every halving, there's the, oh my God, Bitcoin's going to go to the moon. 18 months later, we usually hit our top. We go into a bear market. Everyone thinks Bitcoin's going to fail. And then back again to the hype cycle of, hey, next halving block. Next halving's happening and we go through it again. So we've done that now four times. It's, it's showing the short-term memory of human beings. So I'd say that the risk is very low. The risk is there. And it means that we shouldn't be complacent because we might as well avoid the pain that we don't need to face by intervening before it becomes a problem. And part of that is what we're doing here, having the conversation, you know, so in educating people as to what Bitcoin is, why you should self-custody, why you shouldn't be on the ETF, because that will minimize the pain of anything that they may attempt to do. And just to uh, add here, the BlackRock holds now not even 300,000 Bitcoin, so a little okay. bit over 1% of the supply, uh, not, not even close to the 5%. Uh, I think in total, all Bitcoin ETFs uh, are close to 1 million uh, 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 Bitcoin uh, when you ca calculate all the Bitcoin ETFs uh, together. Uh, something like that, uh, but BlackRock itself only holds uh, around 300,000 Um which is also an interesting, which, interesting debate because uh, MicroStrategy, MicroStrategy also has around that, like they have a yeah, little bit over one percent, also like I don't know, two hundred twenty thousand, two hundred twenty thousand or something like that. Uh, it will be really interesting to, to to see how this all shakes out in the in the long run. But it's yeah, it's still so early. Like the Bitcoin ETS were only approved in January. We're here sitting during June, less than six months of them being running. I would, I would want to see what does this look like in four, five, six years time? Because you have to look at the time horizon of a lot of these institutional investors. And by the way, I'm not an institutional investor. I'm a, I'm an IT consultant slash non-executive. So it's from my learning of the topic from afar, but just seeing how businesses make decisions over the long term, we have five-year plan, 10-year plans, the way that we uh, manage our treasuries on in terms of the company that I sit on is with a wealth manager. We don't do it ourselves. And we look at the time horizon of cash availability in a 10 year period, in a 20 year period, not necessarily in a one, two and three year period. So the problem that we have here in these hype cycles where we're looking, where some people are looking at these ETF inflows daily and whatnot, is that their time horizon is so short they're looking at it in such a short period of time, we have to zoom out and say, okay, well, what does this look like in five years? Does that then seem to pose a problem at its current inflow rate? If they're saying, what is it, that a standard portfolio might eventually have, you know, two to 3% allocation to Bitcoin. And if that's the portfolios of every single wealthy individual superannuation or pension fund around the world, what does that actually look like? How much Bitcoin will they in aggregate hold at that point? And then there's the whole point of, are they all controlled by the individual entity? Because yes, they may control, um, they may all own at the system, but they're all in different countries. They're all maybe different custodians at that point. So will they really be able to coordinate themselves to do anything? And if it's still under you know, 10, 15, 20% of the total circulating supply, is that even enough to do anything to the network? And I, 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 can't, I can't see it. Yeah, and, and I think something really important here to note is, yes, BlackRock uh, holds that Bitcoin, on, uh, Coinbase holds the Bitcoin for 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 BlackRock, and they are yep. not BlackRock's Bitcoin. BlackRock is just uh, managing them for their clients. So that's something important to note that uh, BlackRock is basically just a middleman because Coinbase has the keys uh, and legally owned uh, by other people, and BlackRock is kind of in the middle. Uh, so there's a lot it's more than government intervention. I think it was the more the government intervention on that, similar to what they did in seven in the in the US, where they confiscated gold. Would they do something similar to confiscate the Bitcoin to stabilize the US dollar? Because that's what Nixon did in seventy one when he took them off the gold standard and stopped the redemption of gold for US dollars. It was there to st stabilize the system that they were perverting. Will they do the same thing if the US dollar goes under collapse? I think that's the problem because then you've now centralized that into a government rather than um, uh, the 
Coinbase custodying it on behalf of all the other people that have bought it through the ETF. So they've effectively centralized it that way. So I, I could see that's the case. And the other part is BlackRock's voting power on the various boards in which they also hold ownership of. So how they in how they exert their influence, I don't think is going to be a binary, we can do something to Bitcoin because we've got the ETF. I think it's going to be very complex in that they pull a number of business levers that they've got access to, whether it be political influence in conjunction with business influence in conjunction with Bitcoin ETF influence. So I think there's multiple things that will that they will use in conjunction to get to their outcomes. Mm, I, I love it a lot. Uh, and you also like you have a really great articles uh, that that you have online. Uh, and one of the articles uh, was, I think, that even the, the headline or, or something in, in the beginning was uh, feared and monetary slavery. And this was uh, one yep. of the first topics that I got interested in, in, in like the first topic that I publicly wrote about uh, Bitcoin that was really going wide on, 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 on Twitter, where I made like a short comparison like between actual slavery uh, that was happening in, in the early days and how the fiat system was there. And, and there's yeah, an interesting comparison. Obviously, they are also quite different. It's like a soft form of, 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 of that. Um, but for the people that never heard about that example or for the people that never re read your article, how do you compare fiat with, with slavery and, and why is fiat like monetar modern slavery? Yeah, absolutely. So for a bit of context as to where the opinion sort of stemmed from for the audience, because th this is actually my first podcast, so I've never done this uh, before, so no one will ever, have ever seen me. Um, I do a bit of work as a non-executive director on company boards here in Australia and the nonprofit space. And as a director here in Australia, one of our director obligations is that we need to ensure that we do not have modern slavery at any part of our supply chain. So this is usually targeted at, is there child sex or child or sex trafficking? Is there forced labor that forms part of the way in which we procure goods and services? We all have to make a modern slavery statement that says that we will, that we do not have any modern slavery um, practices within our supply chain to be ethical companies. And that's a legal obligation on us. So when you actually look at the definitions of modern slavery, and I'm just going to pull up that article so I can actually read them out because, you know, people will look at this and those in the fiat system will say, no, 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 it's not modern slavery. You've got the definition wrong. And they'll try to cast doubt on the, on the, on the merit of this statement. So in my article, I actually go through and I pull out the definitions from both the US Department of State, antislavery.org, and the Australian Attorney General's Office as to what the definition of modern slavery is so that it's unrefutable. So modern slavery, and I'll read the US Department of State, uh, US, they describe it as compelled service using a number of different terms, including involuntary servitude, slavery, or practices similar to slavery, debt bondage, and forced labor. So the US in that definition there that they have published themselves says that modern slavery is uh, can be uh, can occur if you have debt bondage antislavery.org um, says something very similar and the Australian Attorney General also calls out debt bondage now I, I say debt bondage because that's the key mechanism by which modern slavery occurs in the fiat monetary system so then, you are, then your next question is, well, what's the definition of debt bondage? So debt bondage, and there's, an, and there's a number of international law definitions, again, US Department of State definitions that I used in order to justify this. But the three takeaways from the definitions are, the first is the in, debt bondage is the inheriting of debt. Second is that the, the reasonable value of the debt not being used to liquidate it. And the third is the length and nature of the debt not being limited or defined. So when we think about debt bondage um, in, the, in the form of maybe you've, you're maxed out on your credit cards, and maybe I'm, let's just say I'm maxed out on my credit cards as an example. If I die, 
that debt stops with me. It's not like my children inherit my credit card debt. The estate is settled. They can't get any more. The debt is then canceled. So in that case, my credit card debt is not inherited um, and therefore not debt bondage. But in the case of the state, when a government spends more than it claims in tax receipts, so that is they're, they're, they're spending more than they get in, they go in, they issue bonds, they get money from the Federal Reserve. In our case, it's from the Reserve Bank of Australia, and they use that borrowed money to make up the difference. And that then becomes a debt to the, to the Australian government, US government, whichever government is printing that money. Now, they will say that most debt comes in the, f- in the form of 10-year bonds, 30-year bonds, whatever it might be. And that's the tenure, the time length in which that debt exists. The problem that I have with this is intent versus, I'll call it the, the lawyer speak. The lawyer speak would say, hey, it's a 10-year bond. It's going to be paid back after 10 years. It doesn't constitute debt bondage because there's a defined term. I say that the government has no intent of paying back the debt. All they've done is used more debt to pay back the old debt. And they roll over the debt bond, that, that bond, and they roll over the debt. Because there is no intent for any government to pay back the debt, and we know this because I know Australia just released our annual budget. We're in surplus for this year, but they've locked us in for a deficit the next two years. So I think we're in surplus, and I'm going to get these figures wrong, so someone will fact check me. I think Australia is going to be in surplus $9 billion for this current, this coming financial year. But the following year, we're going to go $14 billion in deficit. The year after that, we're going to go $25 billion in deficit. So the, the government themselves are saying, we're never paying back this debt, and we're going to increase it. So if you look at the intent of what modern slavery would say, it would say that There is no intent to pay back the debt. The debt will continue to roll over. Once I die and and I have benefited from that debt, it gets inherited by my children and my children's children and my children's children's children as long as the system exists. So therefore, it is debt bondage. And by definition, that is modern slavery. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing, how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self-custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a Bitbox. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners and there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in all of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. I, I love that the broker never heard that with the actual definition uh, of the US treasury and then how it's actually uh, defined. That That's that's really cool. Um, when we come now to the Bitcoin, do you imagine Bitcoin freeing us from that system because at some point fiat will die? I think it'll free us from the system. So. I always look back and I think of, yeah, I've got the, I've got the book there, the Bitcoin standard. I assume that we'll eventually get to that Bitcoin standard. It's going to be a very bumpy ride. It's going to 
harm a lot of people in the process because we're destroying a very ingrained system and any empire change, any system change will feel that sort of disruption and turbulence. So yes, it will free us, but it'll be painful. The part that I'm unsure of is how much that pain is. Because when you wipe out the debt, effectively you're you're saying we're going to go through a debt jubilee. That is, we're going to forgive or we're going to erase all these debts. And that's happened over time. And actually, Lynn Alden's book, Broken Money, goes through that quite well. People will, by definition, lose value as a result of that debt being wiped out because the debt is owed to someone that someone has given out capital and expecting it to be returned. I actually don't know what that looks like. And uh, hopefully a monetary theorist and an economist would be able to talk through that. But in once that does occur, I then believe it, there's, it does then free us from that cycle of debt bondage. Because under a Bitcoin standard, that whole point of going to a reserve bank to print money out of nowhere doesn't exist. It cannot exist because Bitcoin is a scarce, decentralized digital asset. You can't print it out of nowhere. It will force the incentive of the government to only spend within its means and by doing so drive competition within economies in order to drive the prices down. I can't remember which person said this, but um, it's, you know, as technology advances, we should be getting close to the marginal cost of production. That is, the, the economy should be deflationary in nature, which I completely agree, but what we see is inflationary. I think once you go into a Bitcoin standard, you start to see that deflationary nature of the economy start to rise, start to manifest itself. And then as a result, you'll be able to deliver more with less because you become far more efficient at it through technology advancements. And that's what will drive economic growth and stimulation and advancement of all of our countries globally, not the fact that we're just printing money, taking the easy way out. So yes, Bitcoin will solve it, but there'll be damage in the meantime. And I think it's right to call out the damage in the meantime, but I think that it's what is owed. And while you and I, probably younger, will probably pay for it and our parents' generation were the ones that probably benefit from it at the most, unfortunately, it has to stop with someone. We have to break the cycle. And unfortunately, I think it's going to harm us the most or the next generation after us. Uh, yeah, uh, just a quick note. I think this was Jeff, Jeff Booth that said that uh, yeah, in, that's in, the one. In, in, in his book. Uh, for, for everyone listening, I have an episode with Jeff Booth on uh, if, if someone is interested in him or if someone is in the Bitcoin community and does not know about Jeff Booth, I think they should definitely check uh, his work out and, and a great starting audience the episode before. Um, but when we come to this, and I love Jeff Booth's uh, uh, approach because he said everything is on nature level deflationary. Like everything should yep. be deflationary by nature because we're getting better in producing it. And this was a big mind shift I had to do because I was in this inflationary mind and I was like, yeah, of course, the prices go up. But I never really questioned that. <laughs> uh, and when you really question that and you think like, oh, oh, but why do prices go up? Like we get robotics, like we get ma a better manufacturing things. We, we get cleverer in producing things. Why does the price of things have to rise? And we see it, I think, best example is with technology like the iPhone. iPhone prices were rising, but you get so much more value now than with the first iPhone. Like the, the value is like mm -hmm. 20x or 50x from, from the first iPhone because it just got so much better, the camera quality and everything. So the, the, the or maybe let's go in uh, way more back, like a computer in the 19, 1995 or something like that, was not even uh, close to uh, capable of what the iPhone can do now. Uh, and the computer back then was more expensive than the iPhone now. So we see that deflationary mindset, uh, th that deflationary nature, um, but it's actually with everything in the world. Like the banana should be <laughs> become uh, cheaper with, 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 with a normal monetary system. And I say uh, really normal, not sound money, because it's like, when we have just a normal monetary system, which is not debased, um, that would be great. Um, when we spin this thought m long and longer in, in, in the future, do you think we could come to a point where we live in, in abundance because we figured out the, uh, the 
fundamental layer of our society where oh, we have robots that can get the bananas out of the <laughs> the trees uh, and and we have uh, this and that and we really don't have to work to to get our basic needs uh, in order so we can actually focus on i don't know getting us to other uh, other uh, spheres and other s spaces other planets uh, we can focus on making music we can focus on making uh, research about new things and everyone can like really focus on your and in, in, on their own passion i mean this utopia uh thinking but when we think of like prices keep decreasing we we might be at the point where we really live in abundant system is, is that possible or is this dream wishing from my side no no I, i don't think it's possible i think it's inevitable because history would say us tell us that it is you only have to zoom out far enough to realize that history is already telling us that we're heading into that direction if you rewind 10,000 years ago All you would probably be doing day in, day out is trying to figure out where's my next meal coming from? Do I have water that I can drink? Because without those two things, I'm probably going to die within three days. And do I have a form of shelter so that I've, I've got some level of protection? That was 10,000 years ago. Now let's rewind and then suddenly modern agriculture comes in. I think that was, I'm going to get this wrong, 6,000 years ago, whatever it might be. And we were still now producing a bit more abundantly. We didn't have to think about food as much, but it was still hard labor because we hadn't perfected agricultural techniques. Then you rewind to, you know, a thousand years ago and suddenly yeah, agriculture started to flourish. We started to get our wheats and our breads and all of this started coming through. Rewind it even a hundred and something years ago to the start of the 19th century, uh, 19th, no, 20th century, sorry. No, no, did I get that right? No, the 20th century. 1900 to 2000. I'm going to get that one wrong as well. But again, technology had advanced to the point where we are now, we had, yes, blue collar jobs. We also started to see the emergence of white collar jobs that were thought leaders, scientists, thinkers who didn't have to worry about getting food. They were worried about solving the mysteries of the universe, medicines, etc. And now look at us right now. I don't think either you or I are going to have to worry about food per se, as in we'll, we'll survive. There'll be food somewhere. We don't have to go out hard thinking about it. We can create a podcast like this from the comfort of our own homes, make a living. We've already gotten to the point where technology has brought a level of abundance to us. And for what we can see coming down the line, more abundance is, is yet to come to the point of robotics, automation, and AI. You know, Before we started recording, AI's improved my writing um, efficiency by close to two to three X. So that's, uh, that's enabled me to have more time to do other things, which means that to the point of abundance, I'm already experiencing that with a technology that was only really introduced in the last two or three years, let alone what's about to come the next 20, 30 or 40 years. So history would say, absolutely, we are heading towards a, even more abundance. Um, and we're heading towards that at an accelerated rate. And I purposely said 10,000, then 6,000, then 1,000, and then now suddenly we're talking in 10-year increments. Yet the advances in technology are greater than what greater in 10 years now than probably what happened in 1,000 years, you know, a, a, a couple of um, a millennia ago. So history is the greatest teacher. And I think one of our shortcomings is we don't take We don't zoom out anywhere near far enough to be able to put the time period that we're living in proper context. We only look at it from our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation, but we should be zooming out far further than that. And from that, we get better insights into the trends that we're actually on. It's it's fascinating to think about that. And uh, like the, 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 the thought that came into my mind, uh, which is a weird one, but I still say it, um when when we talk about that abundant future and the, the the society coming closer to it it's really good that we have bitcoin now like uh it's it's like what 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 do we do when we, we don't have, have have bitcoin and there's this uh it was a podcast like a two-hour podcast uh it's 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 just speculation um obviously uh but there's this this thought like oh maybe Bitcoin was brought to us by some higher species that uh, observed uh, uh, our Earth and was like, 
there's there's something missing there. <laughs> they, they they need some tec- <laughs> they need some technology there uh, because it's pretty miraculous that we don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Like that, I never I don't know if this ever happened in in, in history where there's such a huge revolution going on and we really don't know much about what where the person is came from and like how this this came to be and and what what his motivations were and stuff like that i mean we know some things from him but not a lot of things uh that that that's a that's a that's just a thought that i just had i wanted to throw it out but and you know the um the satoshi thing's an interesting one i i don't know about aliens giving us technology called bitcoin to do it but the satoshi piece i think is going to be seen as the most important element. His anonymity is going to be known as the most critical piece for why Bitcoin will work. And, I, and I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you my reason why. But I also think, and I'll do a disclaimer, I think that anonymity is also the biggest threat to Bitcoin. Now, they come hand in hand. I think of, I think of it as a double-edged sword. So my thesis on Bitcoin is that it solves for human behavior, not for money. And the framework in which I look at that human behavior is through, look, I, I had my own back, I, my own my own upbringing as a, in religion. I was a Hindu being when I was raised. And so I learned about religious values, religious wisdoms. And my father once told me that um, religion is a way of life. It's not that you necessarily pray to a God. It's a set of principles and values in which that guide you to live a life worthy of the, of the love of God was, is effectively um, the case. It was that sort of upbringing alongside asking that why question that I was talking to at the start, which got me to that point of saying it's solving for human behavior, but not just that human sin. And using that sort of religious context, I realized that there was a great framework to understand all the behaviors that Bitcoin was solving for. It's the seven deadly sins. So the seven deadly sins being pride, greed, gluttony, wrath, envy, sloth. And I think I've forgotten one. But pride, if you look at all those seven deadly sins, is sometimes seen as the root of all sin, or it's the sin in which all others stem from, pride being ego and self-interest. I think Bitcoin solves money through minimizing all that human sin, and we can sort of go through what that actually looks like um, in a bit more detail. But the core one, which is pride, and this is why I think Satoshi Nakamoto's anonymity is by far the most valuable element of Bitcoin is that he tackled pride at the most fundamental level. The first part is in terms of self-interest, the Satoshi's wallet is the most valuable wallet on the Bitcoin blockchain. Right now would probably put him in the top, what, five richest people on the planet. If it is an individual, maybe a group, we just don't know. And yet not a single one of those coins has moved. He has foregone or she or they have foregone foregone all self-interest for the betterment of the network. So that's point one. Point two on ego. We saw this with Craig Wright. He really wanted to be Satoshi Nakamoto, but that was proven to be complete bullshit. But Satoshi has given up his ego by not being known as the creator of the greatest monetary technology humankind has ever seen. So in the act of anonymity, he's provided us with the greatest act of um, humility through foregoing ego and foregoing self-interest. But therein also lies the greatest risk to Bitcoin. Because right now, Bitcoin is greater than any one person. Because there is no creator of it, it belongs to all of us. And so there's no one individual that can be attacked. There's no one face that those that detract against Bitcoin can point to and say, hey, that guy's really evil or that guy's full of it or that guy's greedy and that's and he's, all he's going to do is rug pull us all because that, that guy does not exist. There is no face to Bitcoin. If Satoshi were to ever make himself known with the evidence and move those coins and make his face known, suddenly all the detractors of Bitcoin have a face that they can attack. And suddenly it becomes not about Bitcoin, it becomes about Satoshi Nakamoto, the founder and creator. They'll attack character. They'll attack his um, personal interests of wealth and riches and everything like that. And that in itself 
can break the network because the network is just the confidence of all the miners and all the nodes that by acting by the rules of the system, um, we will all benefit from it. It's a, it's a system with the right incentives in place. You put, some, you put doubt into any of these people's minds by putting the real face of the Bitcoin creator on show and we see the human flaws that are naturally inherent in all of us come to the, full, uh, go, come to the forefront, that's something that can be physically attacked. So that's why I say it's both the greatest strength of, of Bitcoin, but also its greatest weakness if he, were, if he she, or they were ever to make themselves known. I, I, I love it so much. And, and uh, I still can't believe it that it's, it's your first podcast <laughs> because uh, <laughs> you, 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 you are till now one of my favorite uh, interview guests. It's, it's, it's fascinating oh, how, awesome. how, how great are you, you're speaking. Like you're, you're definitely on a, on a, on chef booth level of, of like thinking and, 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 and uh, explanation, at least from, from my perspective, everyone has, has his own favorites, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's awesome. amazing. I, how, I really appreciate how, that. Thank you. How you, you go through that. Um, because that, yeah, if like maybe it's completely off topic, but um, maybe I just quickly say like I have a podcast where I interview everyone. Like next week, I will interview in person Michael Saylor. Uh, yeah. The last few congratulations weeks, had... on that, by the way. I saw your announcement on that one. Then I said, mate, you totally completely deserve it. You've put in the work. Proof of work and proof of reward is there. So I can't wait to hear that one. Yeah, that's that will be a, a crazy one. Like I. Till now, I never did an in-person podcast. And uh, on this day, I will have three in-person podcasts. And nice. one with Michael Saylor, one with the CEO of Treasure, uh, because we are interviewing Michael Saylor in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the office of, of, um, in the office of Satoshi Labs, uh, parent oh, company nice. Of, nice. of Treasure. Uh, and in the morning, I probably have with Luke Brawl. So like, this is my first ever mm. Uh, in-person podcast it will be interesting to see I have, I have no clue how, how good I am in, in person but uh, it's, it, it's the same scale I hope so uh, and uh, like I say it's an easy easy job but the, 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 the point that I, I wanted to uh, they wanted to make is I forgot the point that I wanted to make yeah the, the point that I wanted to make is I have a lot of uh, newbies on like I have a, no, a lot of that are just starting out or have like maybe done one podcast before never done a podcast before some even never done anything really in in the Bitcoin space. I just had some interesting conversations with them on Twitter. I was like, yeah, let's let's jump on a call and let's do a podcast. That's I think the the the, the uh, interesting part about my podcast. You can turn in and there's like someone you never saw before, uh, and and all of a sudden he's interesting because and you've never heard him uh, speak before. And then there's also the big ones, and and it's always a surprise to me like. How how good are those? Because when you never done something, you 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 need a little bit of training. How how you get a point across? And then I'm just uh, <laughs> surprised, positively surprised, how good you are in this. I was, uh, and, and I'll say a part of that comes from part of my career. So the other element, I'm not just a director on boards. I spent, well, I, I'm currently in it, but I've been in sales and consulting and IT for ten years. So. I broke out of it when I started out at a uni, and I'm, I'm now really digressing. I'm a physics major out of uni because I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Realized that I sucked at math. I could, I was good enough to pass uni, but I was never good enough to be great. Like, and math is the language of physics. So if you're not great at the language that describes your discipline, it's very hard to be creative in it. And I will, and I love to be creative, so I pivoted into business. But it forced me into IT sales and consulting. And the first few years in sales, the feedback I'd always get is, hey, you're too technical. Hey, you're going into the numbers. I can't follow you. It makes no sense. And so it forced me to build my skill set of communicating complex ideas to sometimes audiences that had no idea about tech. But I think it's just practice because it took me about 10 years or so to get to the point now where I think I can convey a complex idea in a narrative that sort of makes it easy for people to understand. Uh, so yeah, that's probably where it, where it comes from, uh, sales and consulting. So something good comes out of consultants. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, speaking, uh, if you want to speak good, you have to speak a lot. Uh, it's also what I noticed with the podcast a little bit when I listened to my first podcast and I'm like, oh shit, 
I could have done a better job and, and now it's a little bit better. I still think I could do a better job, but every day doing it, uh, I just noticed that my speaking skills are getting so much better uh, with doing it just every day and you consistently have one hour and you always have a different guest. So there are the guests that I had one guest on and I often speak actually about uh, this one episode where I asked him one question in the beginning and then he spoke for 55 minutes. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> that, that that was really not hard to interview because he just like spoke on his own and there are guests that just give like two sentence answers so that's like the number i'm surprised yeah, oh, he, he just did not give a lot but yeah it's 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 it's, it's interesting how you evolve but the, yeah let's 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 come uh before we because we are close to the one hour mark before we come close to the to the end routine i have um Two more Bitcoin questions that I'm, I'm I'm curious about what you what you what you think of them, um, and you also wrote about that and articles about that. Um, what do you think is the core principle for Bitcoin? Like, what are the core principles of Bitcoin that that you value the most uh, inside of the ecosystem? So, when you, whenever you do research, like what I'm trying to do with the Bitcoin curve, you need to be able to be complex yet simple at the same time you need to be able to have the richness of the complexity of to what makes something tick but you need to understand it so well that you can bring simplicity to it and that's one of einstein's uh, more famous quotes so for me in, in my exploration of it i came down to three core principles that make bitcoin successful the first one we've sort of touched on a little bit which is about this human sin framework that i use in order to get to describe how Bitcoin solving for money. So the first principle I think is minimizing adverse human behavior. That is the behavior that would work in opposition to the intent of the system. The second and third are simplicity and meritocracy. And that's it. Minimize adverse human behavior, simplicity, meritocracy. And the powerful thing about looking at Bitcoin through that lens is that if this was not a Bitcoin podcast and I just said, hey, the, the recipe for success is minimize human behavior, simplicity, meritocracy, there is no way that you'd be able to say that, hey, that's actually Bitcoin or that's solving for money. You could say that's solving for healthcare, that's solving for education. It's, it, they're almost universal principles. And because it's universal, it's fundamental. I wouldn't say universal is fundamental, sorry. These are so fundamental that they go beyond money. So and therefore can be far more meaningful than just saying, hey, we've got hard money again. So, and, and it's quite evident. And, I, and I'm not just saying that, hey, that's what I think. There's evidence behind it. Simplicity is the first one. And I'll quickly touch on both simplicity and meritocracy because I think they're powerful. Simplicity is the Bitcoin white paper was nine pages. It's actually eight pages if you get rid of the reference page. So eight pages to describe what is the solve for the entire monetary system globally was written in eight pages. Now, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do a bit of um, comparison to, to our favorite shitcoin, Ethereum. When Ethereum, the white paper was launched, it was 30 something pages long. So significantly more verbose and complex. When you look at the code base, of Bitcoin, when it was first launched, it was only 14,000 lines of code. And I think right now it's approaching 80,000 lines of code as you know, we've developed it um, as, the, as we've um, adopted it. Ethereum was launched with 660,000 lines of code. And I haven't even looked at to say how much it is now. So even where Ethereum started, we are still 10% of the code base. Yet I would say that we've got a more robust solution than Ethereum will ever have. And that is the almost the essence of simplicity. So that's part one. And meritocracy. This one is going to be overlooked at times, but is the only thing that will keep this system afloat. Merit talks to the best ideas winning out. And when we've seen the Bitcoin's history, we've seen that play out time and time again. They look like existential threats, but all they are is just testing the robustness of our system and our system is based on meritocracy. So when the block size wars came up, it was a grassroots movement from the bottom up, came with the ideas, hey, we should have bigger block sizes. Hey, keep it the same. The debate ensued and the voice of the people that were part of the system that were um, 
users of the system came forward and actually said, no, we're not going to increase the block size. Happy days. But the idea had some merit to increase the block size and there was rigorous debates. There were ideological warfares. There were, you know, I'm, I'm assuming lots of friendships broken in the space at the time, but the best idea won out and Bitcoin is now stronger as a result of it. That is meritocracy at work. There is no intervention. There is no single individual that says it's my way or the highway. It is the best ideas went out. And it's still the case with BIPs. And it's still going to be the case if we ever reach a hard fork, we're going to get into another meritocratic process. So you can almost say that this form of meritocracy is the ultimate form of democracy in many ways, because mm -hmm. it should be the best ideas that win out, not just the people in power win out. So that's why meritocracy and simplicity as fundamental principles and values of Bitcoin um, are going to be important. And just quickly on simplicity, you cannot have a meritocratic system unless everybody in the system can understand what's going on. Mm. So if you don't bring simplicity to the system to allow that access to understanding of the system to everyone, so it could be me as an IT professional, but what if the restaurant worker down the road is also a Bitcoiner, but wants to understand what the future direction of the platform is going to be, or the system, sorry, is going to be, or, you know, a construction worker or a nurse. It has to be simple enough for everyone to understand because then we can all participate. And if we all participate, the system will be stronger as a whole. So if you lose simplicity at any point during this process, you're going to lose people, which means you're going to lose um, participation. And if it's not meritocratic, people aren't going to feel like they had their say that it's not the best idea. And if the best ideas don't win out, it will ultimately fail. So those are the three. Minimize adverse human behaviors, simplicity, meritocracy. I love it so much. Um, this is this is really great because it, it explains uh, what Bitcoin is and on a really fundamental layer um, with principles that are found in every... like. There's this principles, uh, I think Elon Musk talked about that uh, when he says about developing code. He's not measuring uh, a software developer on how much lines of code he can add, but more than how, how many lines of code he can delete and mm -hmm. still get an efficient process. And this is always the, the case in so many other areas, not, a, not only in, in, in technology. You, the, the, the simpler you can get it, the better it is. That's what I also try to do with the podcast. I try to like make the process of having a guest on from I have no contact with the guest to I have a full episode with him out as simple as possible because I wanted to do it daily, which yeah, I only have so many hours in, in a day, so I cannot uh, spend too many hours on, on, on that and too many hours on that. And, and, and I have to make a really simple process which still allows me to get a great podcast out. Uh, simplicity is always uh, a really interesting and, and, and great point. Uh, yeah, I, I, love, I, I love how you think about that, that stuff. Uh, before we get to the actual end routine, uh, I have a <laughs> new end routine that kind of came up in the last few, few episodes. Um, what are you currently passionate about, uh, and and which which we did not cover in the podcast, like was, which is not uh, in 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 Bitcoin? I asked that question for one specific reason. Um, I found out that because we are in the early group of Bitcoiners, Bitcoiners are really interesting people that do a lot of different stuff, and I think uh, as a Bitcoin community, we can learn from each other uh, outside of how money works. Yeah, cool. Um... Well, I'd say the thing that I'm, that because I've only just started, the passionate thing is my research publication. But what I will say is the other one is I, you raised it at the very start of this. And I'm not too sure it was part of the recording, but Bitcoiners seem to also be really into the healthcare piece. So I went hard into the carnivore diet and then now I've modified it now and gotten to the best shape of my life. So there's an element of the gym, which I love, the sauna, which I love, the new diet that I'm on as well. And so I'm going down that rabbit hole on health, genetics, longevity. That part's awesome. And the other part is, so I renovated my entire house myself alongside my wife. So we bought this place during the pandemic. So side story. So I'm based out of Melbourne, Australia. We were the most locked down city in the world because I think we spent 260 something days 
under effectively house arrest. But by the way, that's also one of the reasons why I'm an avid Bitcoiner because I was stripped of so many of my rights. But during that period of time was the best time because we'd just bought this house, needed renovation. So I got onto YouTube. I found a number of DIY videos from this guy out of Canada. And then he taught me how to do it. So I did all my plastering, flooring, did the entire kitchen myself. I've done, um, I've just built some laundry doors just over that side there, um, all these little projects and um, redone the entire backyard. So we're almost trying to get as self-sufficient as possible with fruit trees and everything like that. So I've gone not quite tinfoil hat, but as self-sufficient as humanly possible. But the cool thing about it is when you actually start to just think, you know what, I can, I can give it a go, I can just do it, is it's far easier than what you actually think it is. Because I thought, you know, plastering, that seems like that seems like pretty hard work or installing a kitchen, that seems like I could screw it up. In actual fact, it actually isn't that hard. Like after you, after you look at a couple of videos and you attempt it yourself, putting in a kitchen is actually not that hard. You just need to take your time. And so push, I think that was me pushing myself to try and do something new. YouTube, you can learn pretty much anything that you really want to learn uh, and just give it a go. Because for me, it turned out awesome. And my wife loves me even more now because I saved us, I think, 80 grand in, in tradey fees. Uh, and and uh, so that was a extra plus <laughs> from that little hobby of mine. I, it's, it's fascinating to hear about the, the COVID era because... On the one side, I really hated that we had those extreme lockdowns. And I mean, you were in an extreme place where there are really hard lockdowns. I can remember that uh, I went to uh, play beach volleyball uh, in, um, I think, June 2020 in Austria, because then they were like opening up a little again after the lockdown. And I don't know, it was what was February, March, like it was not that long. And then I could actually go out with friends again. Uh, and uh, it, it was not even that hard executed. Like this, the rules were stricter than the Austrian uh, police was was governing. And but when I look at what Australia did, this was like long way, <laughs> way different than that. But the the positive point that I always get is like people, most people, not everyone, but most people were completely stopped in what they were doing till now including me uh, and all of a the sudden they had time to research they have time to think they were forced to be in the house they could not meet friends they were forced to be for themselves and this is something quite valuable actually when you're all of a sudden forced to think uh, and what do you do with your time and most people were researching doing some creative stuff and this was this is the the biggest benefits from I always I'm really optimistic person. So I'm always trying to figure out what, what what's the good of that. Uh, that's like my my head is always like when something bad happens. Like what is the what is the best thing I can get out of this bad thing mm. happened? Uh, it is always like how my, my mind works, and this is what what I'm going to in this area because it's actually a quite nice thing that that happened there. Uh, and this is why a lot of Bitcoiners say, oh, yeah, in 2020, I discovered and, and researched about Bitcoin. Or we're like, oh, I started this in 2022 in the COVID area. I, I heard that sentence so many times. Uh, and, and this is the, the one thing uh, that is really positive about that area. Uh, and, and yeah, I love that, uh, that you also had that experience. I think it's like a sink or swim kind of moment. There are those that will look into that adversity and find opportunity and those that will opt to wallow in their adversity. And for a lot of us, we saw the opportunity because our eyes were opened or we tried to take the more positive lens on making something good out of a bad situation. So I, it, it separated for me a lot of people because I still see quite a, quite a few people that are adversely impacted by it because they um, retreated into themselves through that period. And as a result, you know, they're, they're far worse off. But for those, to your point, and I know a lot of Bitcoiners who found Bitcoin similar to me in that 2020 era, um, we got possibly the greatest opportunity of our lifetimes because we got to start stacking <laughs> effectively uh, at, 
at that bottom end of that 18, 19, 20,000 piece and got to see the run up. So it was, uh, there's always opportunity in adversity. It's just, you just need to open your eyes to it and go in with that mindset and that worldview. Yeah. I, I, I blow again. Never uh, buy as many Bitcoin than I bought in 2020 under 10,000. It was, it was an it, amazing you time. You can never buy enough. At any <laughs> point like, in time, you can never buy enough. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, coming to the end routine, the actual end routine that I had since the beginning, since the first episode of the podcast, and we're now at 145 actually already. Um, we have the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question uh, for the next guest without knowing who actually is cool. the next guest. Uh, so this question is the one question that is not coming from me, it's coming from the previous guest. And it's the one question that sometimes brings up a completely new topic sometimes it's uh, an, a new interesting thing uh to the to the topic that we already had and it's an interesting uh, this was a question that because 145 questions some of them are double in there uh, already but this is a completely new and uh, unique one oh, nice uh who who was the hardest person you ever orange pilled and how did you finally convince him in the end? Oh, that's a tough one. I'm going to say the hardest one only because it took the most amount of effort was my wife. And I'll, I'll say, and, and I'll give you a bit of context to the, to the answer. Those that have orange pilled have been ready to be orange pilled. And I think that this is a consistent theme when I talk to people. If you push Bitcoin too hard down people's throats, they're not going to be receptive to it. You almost need to be known as the Bitcoin guy so that people know who to come to when they're curious. And so a lot of the people that I've orange pilled are people that have known that I'm the Bitcoin guy that have then come to me rather than me forcing it down their throat. So it's really hard to say who the toughest person is. But in my wife's case, she had no choice. But I knew that she trusted me. So I was stacking stats and she just said, okay, I trust you. I got it to the point of needing to understand why I was doing it so that she believed as hard as I did. Because when you're married, you're on a life journey together and it's not enough that she trusts you to do it. I think for me, it had to be, she needed to understand deeply enough that she was also on that same path of thinking as me. And I knew because we were married, we came with the same values and principles. And so the reason why it was the hardest was she's very different to me. I'm a physics major, mathematician, I'm analytical as, as you can come. She's a graphic designer, advertising agency, um, account director. She's more on the creative front. And so you had, I had to describe what Bitcoin enabled us to be able to do to, uh, in the life that we both wanted, which got me thinking very differently about why Bitcoin is so important, why fiat in contrast was actually our worst enemy, not our great ally. And even now, why property, because Australia, we're property rich, why buying more property was actually the wrong thing and buying more Bitcoin was the right thing and getting her to the point of comfort in volatility. So I think that's probably the hardest one because it stretches your thinking the furthest. Uh, I, I love that answer a lot and it's... My, my girlfriend did not get it till now, uh, fully, but uh, <laughs> she, 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 she will come there. Uh, and, and I'm also, uh, approaching it from a slow perspective, uh, because she's exposed to more and more Bitcoin as she's exposed to more and more Bitcoin content. Uh, and, and she, she will get it in the end and, and she's asking more questions about it. Uh, and I'm confident as you also said, because she has similar values, uh, there's a reason why we are together uh, and why we chose to, to be on this life journey together. Uh, in the end, she will come to the same conclusion or like a similar conclusion than, than I came with Bitcoin. Uh, and, and this all takes time. Uh, uh, and this time is, is okay to be taken. Yeah. Um, perfect. And uh, thank you all for, for, for being on the show. Before I let you go, um, where can people find you? Where can people ask you questions? Yeah, cool. Uh, I am on X now. Like until I started this publication, I really wasn't, but I'm on X at Arv's Notes. That's A-R-V-S-N-O-T-E-S. -E but if you want to read the work that I do, you can go to my Substack, which is the Bitcoin Curve .substack .com, And I'll soon be doing audio, visio, audio visual versions of the articles because I know that they're long form and people just sometimes don't want to read it. 
and I'll I'll create a YouTube. But if you go to the Substack, you go to my my um, Twitter X profile, you'll be able to get in contact with me uh, on both of those platforms. Amazing, yeah, and and uh, I would even encourage you to uh, because. I see that you have really great uh, um, uh, articles and really great content and and unique uh, styles of delivering it. Uh, I think it would be great to do. I mean, it's a lot of work, but it's, it would be great to have a book from from you if you uh, did not have <laughs> yeah. to, to plan that. Uh, that's a big I, I endeavor. Like... I was going to say that was that's. It's probably going to be closer to Lynn's journey. I think Lynn's a great example as to what I'm trying to emulate in that created content slowly, built up the library built up the knowledge base. And then when the book idea came about, she was able to execute what was an incredible book and something that I still, you can sort of tell from all the little tabs on top of it, I reference a lot in my work now. And so I, I have a lot of respect for how she went about it. So I, I'd say the book is probably on the horizon, but not till I've got enough value that's acknowledged, I think, by the audience and the articles that I do. And maybe one day that'll be on the cards. Amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm already looking forward uh, to do the, do the podcast interview with when you launch the book. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'll hold you up. I'll hold you to that offer. Perfect. Then yeah, thank you for being on off uh, and for everyone listening as always. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Bye.